Hello, it's me, Rachel. How is everyone? I'm finally doing this. I'm finally uh, catching up with, um, or doing a catch up on, where are we? Um, we're in February. <laughs> I'm still trying to relax after a very busy work day. Anyway, what I meant to say was January recap, January into February a bit. Um, so we finally have experienced some winter. Um, yeah, here in New England, I experienced uh, the first winter I could think of in years really where there really wasn't any snow and I found myself actually missing it and appreciating the beauty of it and I remember telling my boyfriend that like I actually would like some snow and he's like really <laughs> like we're both from Buffalo originally so uh <laughs> I don't think I have to tell you that we've seen our fair share of it and it's not something that we usually look forward to but um, aside from that, recently, like the past couple of days have been extremely cold, like so cold that you're afraid to go outside even to take out the trash. And um, but there's no snow anymore. So it would have been nice to have some some whiteness outside to contrast, you know, against like the bleakness of how bitter cold it was. But now the snow has all but gone completely. So I don't know what the rest of winter looks like, but we are um, in February now. It's February 5th. Um, I'm telling you all this like, needless information. Um, so what has been up? Um, not too much. I've been quite content sitting at home, um, just focusing on my day-to-day, -day, you know, work, fitness, cooking, and carving out time for studies and art. And the same thing with my daughter. She says she's very happy to be a hermit. <laughs> um, we had to go to, I say we had to, I'm such a terrible person. We went to a Chinese New Year party yesterday uh, we were invited to go this uh, local restaurant in town. We've known the family who owns it for years. And we typically go every year. And uh, it's very, very busy and very noisy. Free food. And they give you like these little drink tickets when you walk in for a couple of free beverages. And... Um, they give you like little envelopes with, you know, like $5 inside. I don't know why I'm telling you all this, um, but <laughs> it was nice, but I really had to gear myself up to go. Like I didn't want to. <laughs> I did, but I didn't. Um, I think I would have enjoyed it more had I not been afraid to run into someone that I, I'm not going to talk about it, but I didn't want to see. So I think... Had I not been nervous and trying not to look over my shoulder the entire time, I probably would have enjoyed it more or not been as nervous as I was. But aside from that, yeah, it's just been um, weird for me lately. I get like that. Like if I spend a lot of time um, at home or isolated, I find it even harder to reacquaint myself with society I've never been good at small talk anyway, <laughs> but I'll get to a point where like, I don't even want to go to the grocery store or anywhere. I don't want anyone to see, like, I'll, I'll go into Target wearing my sunglasses and it's night and I don't care. I just, I don't want to be seen. So, um, yeah, that's just some little, I don't know, a little tidbit of fun information about my strangeness. But, um, but yeah, on a whole, it was, it was nice. I, I could have just 
decided to stay home, you know, but I went, I went. And my daughter didn't really, she wasn't really feeling the enthusiasm either, but, but she went as well. And then later on, we stepped back out to get some cannolis at the little Italian bakery here up the street. And, uh, and then we sat and watched some Monty Python flying circus, which I don't know. I'm, I'm so weird as a mother, like with my judgment and what I, what I deem appropriate for my daughter and compared to what I, what I don't find appropriate. And Monty Python is a bit problematic, but she's, you know, she's very worldly and you know, educated on things. And we, we talk about what, you know, satire is like, this might seem politically incorrect, you know, um, but maybe if, if someone is, if something seems sexist, it's not necessarily that that's how they viewed women. It's more like they're poking fun at how they were portrayed at that time, um, you know, in certain media. So, and she, she gets it as long as you don't just go into it blindly. I don't know. I am just trying to, um, unwind. And that was, that was my, that was yesterday. <laughs> um, so let's see, where do I start? Um, I suppose I should get into some of the decks that I've been using. Thank you for bearing with me, by the way, anyone who's still watching. <laughs> so um, let's see, how about something that I have bought recently? So I got this. Um, this is an Il Manigello. This is, um, I have, I've always called it, um, you know, the Napoleon Tarot but it's Taraco Napoleonico. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know. I was just always intrigued by this. Um, I guess it's sort of, you know, novelty. It's quite themed, but it's, yeah, it's um, Napoleon. <laughs> this is a um, a deck from the 1980s. Um, I don't know. I love Tolstoy's War and Peace. And I think that was um, one of the reasons that I was attracted to this. Because, you know, if you know War and Peace, you know, it's... <laughs> all about Napoleon's decision to try and invade Russia. Um, so, I don't know, something made me decide that it was a, a good idea to go ahead and buy this while I still could, um, while it was in print. I found, um, yeah, I found, I don't know why I can't talk, oh my God. Um, I found a good deal. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but yeah, it's Il Manigello, Um, Just, you know, sumptuous cardstock. There's those that color that I like on the backs again. Um, yeah. So I thought that this would be a fun, unique deck for my collection. And I've used it a couple of times, you know. I don't know what else I wanted to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so it's February and I don't know why, but like I, I'm a sucker for, um, not necessarily Valentine's Day, but I, I love, I don't know why, like the hearts, 
<laughs> I love Valentine's Day decorations. I think they're really cute. I love the pink and red and white hearts and I don't know they just they get me every time if I walk into Michael's with my daughter because she wants some craft stuff I'm like oh like look it's all so pretty um so yeah keeping that in mind I don't know I've been feeling compelled to use this a lot the past couple of days because it's very you know like red and pink and um uh, yeah, Triumphi Della Luna, everybody I think knows that I love these decks. So this one, I was very lucky to find. Um, this was, uh, this is an out of print deck. I owned the, um, the Rose Mutation in the Illustrated Pips, and I love that. But I think I've mentioned before, like, I really wanted the original Marseille Pip style and it was out of print and I was on eBay one day and I think it was just meant to be that I saw someone was selling this and I didn't even hesitate. I probably should have hesitated because I don't know when I got it into my head that, you know, I could just basically buy whatever I wanted so long as I wanted it badly enough like it was justified you know I don't want to go off on a tangent about um spending and what you should and shouldn't buy and what's important and what's not but um yeah I think that February for me is going to be a time to hone in and uh focus on how I'll benefit from creating more of a budget. I do think that um, given circumstances, I have fallen into a bit of emotional spending. You know, I never get to a point where I, I can't make ends meet. Oh, there's my devil chickens that everybody knows I love. Little beasties. Um, anyway... Um, but I do find myself feeling a little bit of, uh, anxiety about things. And it would feel good to be saving again, because that was something that I used to be really, really good at. I was quite, you know, prudent. Um, and then, you know, the past couple of years have been have been really rough. I've been happy, but things, you know, times have been trying. And, um, yeah, buying books that I love and, and decks and music and other things is a distraction, a, um, a fun distraction. Um, but, yeah, anyway, um, I don't know why I went off on that, but I love this deck. I love all of these color mutations, and uh, this has been um, a very fun, inviting deck for me, quite warm the past couple of days where it's been so cold outside, and like I said, you know, February, Valentine's Day, red and pink, it's just been fun, it's been a vibe. Um, so, yeah. It's funny, so today I drew this card. I got the Eight of Wands for one of my readings. It was um, my full moon uh, spread that I did today. And then I did a reading for February, like a February monthly spread and goals for my planner I hadn't done yet. And I used this, the Russian Tarot of St. Petersburg. I know I've been showing this a bit. Woo, I like whistled. <laughs> um, I've been showing this in many of my recent videos, but I, I love it. Um, so I used this um, like right after my full moon and I can't find it. But anyway, the first card I drew was again, the eight of wands. And I was like, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and then for my daily reading later on, 
I used the the Agorov or the Agorov. I don't know exactly how you pronounce this. Oh, I love this deck. Anyway, again, the first card I drew was the Eight of Wands, and I just burst out laughing. I'm like, all right. I guess that's, you know, the card of the day. Wow. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I guess I'll show this deck. Oh, no, here I go again. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the, an out-of-print deck that I just... Yeah, if you know me... If you know me, you know, like, this is me. And I felt that I really needed it in my collection. <laughs> um, I love, I love these aces. So yeah, this has been, um, also I feel like this has got sort of those I don't know why, but those those fun like um like Valentine's Day vibes for me. I think it's you know the wands, the pinks. Um, it goes alongside my Triumphi della Luna well somehow, and you know the the uh, Tarot of Saint Petersburg. Wow, look at that moon. This is just beautiful. Yeah, it, it feels very uh, nostalgic to me. It reminds me of, you know, picture books. Like classic picture books that I looked through when I was younger. I just love it. But yeah, not an easy duck to find. So yeah, so considering I got the Eight of Wands, I was thinking, okay, usually um, I take that as meaning like if I'm feeling inspired, um, I better act on that impulse as soon as I can because it's fleeting. And I know like tomorrow's Monday and I'm sure I'm not going to have the energy tomorrow considering I have to get up early to take my daughter to school that I'm feeling right now. So I thought, well, you know what? Um, maybe I should do a video. Maybe I should finally do my um, January, February uh, recap now because I've been meaning to do it. So that's why we're here, Eight of Wands. <laughs> also, it could have been a reflection of the work day that we had. Lots and lots of messages coming through. And anyway, that's another story. Um, so yeah, let's... I know what I wanted to talk about. All right. So, um, yeah, the last time I did one of these was back in, when was it? Like the end of December? Yeah. So let's talk about, I guess, some books and then I'll show some other decks. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, where is it? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So, anyway. I feel Colhoun. I read and finished this last month. This is her, like, travel log on Ireland. And it was a, just a very beautiful reading experience. Just makes me want to travel all the more um maybe one day we'll see um I've I've come to accept the idea that it might not happen for me but I can go there or feel that I'm there um given the right atmosphere or you know immersive reading experience or listening experience if that makes any sense so um, yeah, I highly recommend, I highly recommend if you, if you like Ethel Colhoun or, uh, Ireland, you know, 
um, or just, you know, travel books. It's, it's a good one. Um, and then let's see books, books, books. Okay. So yeah, I talked about this in one of my videos. I'm still working on my, uh, Dylan Thomas alongside the reader's guide. So I think I mentioned before I'd already read basically this volume like last year. And then I, p I picked up a second copy, and this one is like an expanded edition that came out after he had passed away. And um, I decided to enrich my experience because, you know, some of his poetry can be a little bit hard to decipher, especially some of his earlier poetry. And um, I thought that this might just, you know, help enrich it a bit. And so I've been, you know, working through this um, I'll, I'll read his, you know, sub, subnosis, his breakdown, ugh, I can't talk, on the poem, and then you read the poem alongside it, you know, and, um, yeah, I just, I, I love, uh, Dylan Thomas, and so I've been savoring this because I just feel like it's something that I sort of want to be continuously reading, <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, my Band-Aid is, is so annoying. I think uh, if you saw one of my videos uh, where I mentioned that I'd cut myself cooking, <laughs> which is something unusual for me um, that I don't tend to do, but yeah, quite annoying. Um, okay, so I am also reading this. So this is um, the second travel log or travel book that Ithel wrote. This one is Cornwall. And I'm like uh, a little bit more than halfway through this one. And another joy of a read. I've, I've been learning a lot. And um, yeah, my daughter and my boyfriend are intrigued because they're like, oh, Cornwall, you know, because we are we are watching Poldark and we just finished watching the Poldark series uh, for the second time around and um, kind of sad to see it go. But there's there are other things to watch. So speaking of that, I mentioned how I thought maybe I'll read the books. So I picked up a vintage hardcover copy of the first book that I found on eBay. And I don't know when I'll get around to reading this series. I only have just this book. Um, I did put it on my list for 2023. Uh, we'll see if I have time for it. If not, it'll just wait. Yeah. So, um, I am reading this, The Once and Future King. So what happened was, um, when was it? New Year's Eve. Um, my daughter, she had asked me um, if we could watch Camelot again. We watched Camelot like probably around this time last year. And um, I was like, yeah, that's an excellent idea. Let's watch Camelot. So we watched Camelot, and then she wanted, of course, to watch The Sword and the Stone again. And um, I'm sure you know, or maybe you don't, like, Sword and the Stone, the Disney film, is, like, the the first part of this book by T.H. Th. White, The Once and Future King. Um, it was written in, like, The Sword and the Stone was written in, like, 1938 or something, and then I think in the 1950s, he had the whole, the whole book, like, instead of the installments, he, he put them all together to form the Once and Future King. So The Sword and the Stone covers Arthur, or the warts, um, you know, coming of age, growing up with Merlin as teacher. And then Camelot, if you know Camelot, the film, like, 1967... Richard Harris, Vanessa Redgrave, um, that is also from T.H. White's The Once and Future King. That's like, you know, the second half of the book. So I had read this 
years ago. I don't even remember when I read it. I only remember how it struck me as just being something like so profound and so beautiful. I'd always been intrigued by King Arthur anyway, but wow, it was one of the best things I ever read. I can't even remember if I read it before my daughter was born or after, but I always wanted to read it again. And I have a really beautiful paperback copy of that. Um, and I decided I didn't want to read that one again because I just wanted to keep it in good condition. So I found another copy to read that I bought recently. It's funny that I'm reading this though, because, um, where is it? What I had purchased recently to read for this year was this, The Romance of Arthur. So this is an anthology of texts in translation. So, you know, Arthur, if you know anything about King Arthur, I mean, it's very, very old, old legend. Um, some scholars think that he might have been some, like, you know, Roman British general or leader who, um, you know, um, defended against the Anglo-Saxon invaders even back in, like, I don't know, the fourth or fifth century or something like that that's one theory and that would make sense but um I've read some of these like I read Sir Thomas Mallory years and years ago I've read um Sir Gawain and the Green Knight a few times one of my favorite poems I love that um but this seems like a really good anthology because they give you the texts or snippets of things and of course, there's all of this um, uh, research that's done on it. Um, I can't find my words very well tonight. I'm sorry. I thought it was a very good time to record. Maybe not. Um, yeah, all of this like cultural context. It's, it's a history book. It's a history book with some great, albeit maybe uh, difficult literature to digest alongside that. So yeah, Camelot, 1967, by the way, beautiful film. Um, I didn't think that I cared for the, I didn't think I cared for it musically, really. It wasn't like my favorite music. I've, I've come around to appreciate it more, but the story itself uh, is brilliant. It's, it's brilliant. It's T.H. White. It's just full of of wisdom and uh, I think my boyfriend teased me about it one time he's like well what's what's so important about King Arthur you know it's just a fairy tale and I was trying to think of like a good comparison or analogy or something and I said well uh I was like okay uh you love the godfather right <laughs> I'm like you and your little goofy Italian friends are always going on about like the, you know, the relevance of the lessons of the Godfather in, in real life. He's like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, well, King Arthur is the Godfather, okay? I'm like, it's basically like an older version of, of the Godfather. Um, and he's like, oh, okay, you know, because I think, you know, there were like many, um, even kings and queens who, who believed he was a real king and they go on pilgrimages to find like his burial site or birthplace or something like that. And he was, um, the role model or some, or, um, you know, um, something to aspire to or a reminder. Like, uh, I love, um, in Camelot and T.H. White, like, you know, instead of, um, might is right might for right it's just brilliant so um yeah the movie um for whatever reason Richard Burton and uh, Julie Andrews decided not to reprise their roles so you have Richard Harris and Vanessa Redgrave and I, I love Richard Burton but Richard Harris is awesome too and I think he really he really wanted that role. Like when Richard Burton turned it down and there were some other contenders, he really fought for that. And I think it's, I thought he was brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'll probably end up talking more about the beauty of the Once and Future King in the future, I'm sure, as I am rereading it. Um, hmm. So what else? Um, speaking of that, Oh yeah, and here's 
here's the movie, by the way. The movie cover. I just love the art. Yeah. Um, speaking of Arthur, I bought this. This had been something that I'd been looking at for years. And I don't know. I was I was reading Once in Future King, like I said, and it made me think of this. And I love um Will Worthington's art. He did the Druid Craft. And I think he did the Wildwood as well. And um, this was like eight bucks, okay? And I'm just going to show you a few cards. I wish that this was a tarot deck. I really do. Um, I don't think... I'm not sure. I don't think I'm going to end up really using this as an oracle. I think I just needed it because I was fangirling about... Arthur and I'm always tempted to get any deck out there on Arthur but I wish this was a tarot deck to me this is like some of the best um Arthurian depictions that I've ever seen his characters his people just look like real people they have such depth of character and you know you see that in the the druid craft as well um but I just I wish this was I mean, I might use this for some divination purposes, but I think it's totally fine sometimes to have a deck just for the sake of the art. Yeah, this was like $8. It's so beautiful. Yeah, my first car, actually my only car that I ever had, um, I named it Merlin. And I guess my uncle had a pet wolf named, named Merlin as well. All right, so um, let's see. What else with decks? I'm just kind of all, all over the place. I was going to be more or organized about like, this is what happened very late December and this was January but I'm not I'm just like I'm so sorry I'm all over the place so yeah I've been using my Deviant Moon and I'm not going to bring that out because everybody knows Deviant Moon and I've talked ad nauseum about that lately um I've been using my beautiful Ithil Calhoun tarot as color um I know I showed this in my last like at present video but I'll just show a few of the cards again. I really wish that I could have gotten the hardcover book, but I can't spend like $400 on it. That's usually what I find it for lately. And again, I do not at all regret the decision to buy a backup of this. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I just sort of, I just sort of stopped talking because <laughs> I'm just sort of in awe whenever I open this deck. I love the Hierophant. So it was funny, um I <laughs> in my last video I was talking about the backs. Oh, here we go again. Why do I why is this happening to me lately? <laughs> Okay, so I was talking about the backs and how they reminded me of uh, something from my past and how I mentioned uh, my parents' bathroom and somebody, <laughs> someone close to me was like, they asked me about that. They're like, what? <laughs> what? Like your parents' bathroom? That's really weird. I'm like, yeah, I think what I meant to say was that um, I think... When I was a, like a kid, like a little kid, um, I would daydream in the shower, right? I would daydream in the shower and I would see like all these fantasy worlds or what I thought my future was going to look like. Or maybe I was daydreaming about, um, the, you know, um, the past or like what the world used to be like, you know? Um, 
and I think the backs made me think of that. Like maybe uh, this, we had a sliding glass door in our shower slash tub. And it was like this, it looked like this. It was like this frosted um, patterned glass. And I think that's what I meant to convey. And instead I was just like, these remind me of my parents' bathroom. So I just wanted to clear that up. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, yeah. So let's see. Um, what else? Let's talk about some movies, I guess. So last month I watched the Banshees of Ina Sharon. It's I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Um, I loved it. Uh, my boyfriend came in as I was watching it and I was trying to watch it alone because I didn't think that anybody else would enjoy it. I sort of knew what it was about before I started watching it and I was just like, no, I got to watch this alone. But he saw most of it and he was like, wow, that's, that's a really great movie. I loved the acting and just everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, he basically <laughs> has the same taste as me. Um, I always find that astounding how it's very, very rare that he doesn't like something that I enjoy. He has good taste. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's probably why he's with me. But um, anyway, so I'm not going to really talk about the movie um, because I don't want to um, give away any spoilers, but it's it's set during like the Irish Civil War in 1923 and it's not a war film it's just like you know the setting it's sort of metaphorical it's about a friendship that breaks up and um I okay so Lambert if you are watching this uh no I don't think this is a movie for you um it's a little bit it's a little bit violent it's um it wasn't anything that really bothered me um it's was um it's it's called like a tragic comedy like a very like um a dark comedy um anyway it's i i loved it but i i don't know anyone watching this what your taste is i'm not saying go and watch it but i just wanted to say i watched it and i thought it was awesome the scenery was beautiful too um so what else i recently watched um Girlfriends. Uh, it's a film from uh, 1978. And um, it's about this young woman living in New York City. Uh, she's a photographer. And she feels um, this sense of betrayal and confusion after her best friend, who's also her roommate, moves out to get married. And uh, she's just feeling, I don't know, she's just feeling like lonely and... Um, just feeling some sort of void and uh i loved it and it it's it's a movie that like makes you think about relationships and um how we perceive one another how others perceive us and or, like the grass is always greener kind of thing like i it made me think like i never actually experienced living on my own I, for a short spell, did have an apartment when I was in my teens with a couple of other girls. It was horrible, but then I went and moved back in with my parents after a few months, so I never experienced that. I was the friend in the film who was never alone. Like, I've basically been in some sort of relationship since I was, like, <laughs> 22, and I'm not 22 anymore. So, um, it's just, yeah, it, it's, a. Uh, I liked it and it's one of those movies it was um the I loved everything aesthetically about it like I wanted the curtains I wanted the carpets I wanted the lamps I wanted what they were wearing I just loved it um what else oh so um I have a really good comfort movie for you Lambert if you're watching it's called I Know Where I'm Going, 1945. Um, yeah, so it's this this really headstrong, spoiled girl. She's set to marry this really rich guy. He's like the head of British Chemical Corporation. It's a, it's a British film. 
and they're supposed to be married on some Scottish island like called Caloran. But there's this huge gale when she gets to Scotland and nobody will take her there um, by boat. And she keeps trying to find all these ways to get there and they get caught in this horrible storm. And anyway, it's just good. It's just a lighthearted romantic film without, in my opinion, being very corny. Um, I just loved it. And so I highly recommend that as a feel good movie with like a lot of um, really beautiful scenery and cinematography. All right, so what else did I need to talk about? I need to start wrapping this up a bit. So I got this recently. <laughs> I was so excited. Um, I have wanted this deck for years and I thought it was out of print because it was every time that I that I looked for it. And recently, this is thanks to um, I missed the grade. Oh my god, did I say grade? <laughs> anyway, I missed the gray. Um, I was watching her fun tag uh, coffee house decks, which by the way, I'm meaning to do. And I've been um, taking some notes on which decks I want to include. She had this deck and I was like, oh my God, um, this is in print. So I, without very little hesitation, I went and bought it while I could, because I knew like, you know, it would probably go out of print again. So this is, yeah, just a very beautiful, historical reproduction deck. It's from the 1600s. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm distracted. I'm hearing like noises. I think maybe my cat is trying to come in. <laughs> yeah, I have to wrap this up. So I'm just going to kind of show you some cards. Yeah. I'm so excited about this. Like whenever I open this up, I can't believe that I'm looking at it because I just thought that like this was like a, what is it? What do you call it? A unicorn deck, you know? I didn't think it was ever going to be in my collection. And here it is. And I love the backs. This could be like a Valentine's Day deck too, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's see here. Um, oh yeah. So I read this recently. This is Nabokov's The Eye. Um, so yeah, I found myself missing the way that, um, I used to find myself engaged with with what I was reading, usually good literature. Um, when I was younger, like a teenager in my 20s, um, even my later 20s, I used to be acutely perceptive of things like signs and symbols um, or um, spoken or written words. And um, I didn't realize that I was, you know, um, so perceptive of such things until I noticed the past couple of years that I don't feel quite that connection to the world around me. Um, at that time that I had that acute perception of being able to recognize like signs and symbols, um, premonitions and things, I wasn't studying any tarot or any metaphysics of any sort. So um, I've been feeling compelled to start looking again for for signs like regarding which books I should read next. I used to do that. I used to look for signs and then so I had this uncanny ability to sort of pick up the right book at the right time. That's very important sometimes for um, your reading pleasure, picking something up at the right time, but also something that's going to inspire you um, to create something. Um, so yeah, I think literature is actually, you know, quite a big part of my spirituality. It opens my eyes to, you know, motif played out in my actual life or sense of destiny or something. And Nabokov was one of those 
artists who definitely did that for me. He's a complicated guy. We're not going to talk at length about Nabokov, okay? We're not. Not right now. I mean, he was a polemicist, you know, but I love, like, reading his rants. I, I tend to laugh at them while also seeing where he's coming from. But, I mean, some of the people that he doesn't like, like, he has this big beef against, like, Dostoevsky. I love Dostoevsky. Whatever. He also... um. He all he always talked against um women writers like that's ridiculous, but I cannot deny like his genius and he was very he was fascinated with um time and uh the idea that it's not linear and uh metaphysics and where we go after we die and i just i just um yeah. <laughs> I decided I was looking for signs and I'm like, yeah, I think you, you need to read some Nabokov. And I picked up the eye because this was one that I hadn't read before. And I was sitting in the car waiting for my daughter. And it was when I read when I read his writing, it's writing that makes me sit back in my seat and just go, wow, like just, you know, digest it slowly and inhale, exhale, sort of like take it all in like, wow. It's an experience. So the eye has opened my eye again. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not even going to talk about what this is about um, because I'm running out of time. Uh, yeah, and I don't know if it's really fit for YouTube. So we're not going to talk about that. Um, oh, yeah. So I got a couple of extra Christmas gifts because the last time I did this was like right after Christmas. So, so cute. A gift from my brother, one of my brothers, and a gift from my sister. So I got from my brother this perfume, this Montal Jasmine Foal. Smells quite nice. Jasmine, um, I love perfume. Uh, hang on a second, I need to sip of my water. Yeah, he had these um he had these points to use on uh sacks and he said, I'll pick out a perfume. So that was a fun little um surprise. And then from my sister, she sent me this and I was like, Oh my god. Nabokov lectures on Russian literature. And I was like, How did you know? I'm like, How did you know this? This is perfect. I have the other volume of this. Um, it's just literature. I forget which um, authors he talks about in there. Um, but she said years ago we um, had written lists of books that we wanted and we gave one another the list so that if we were ever in a store or something or needed a gift, we could uh, check out the list. And this was on the list. And I was like, oh. So that's fun. So excited about that. Um, what else did I not talk about? Um, yeah, also, I got this for my daughter. I just wanted to mention this as one of her birthday gifts, Doctor Who, the card game. And so this is the classic Doctor edition. By the way, we love Doctor Who. <laughs> we'll talk about that sometime. But there's also a, um, like, a current Doctor edition, which she just bought with her money. But I just want to say, I, I wished, I sort of wish that this was like some sort of divination deck because yeah, it would be like novelty and quirky, but I just think it would be so much fun. There aren't really any, there are no like Doctor Who decks. Um, there's probably a reason for that. Some, you know, copyright thing and it might be awful. Um, if someone did try to do one, I don't know. I'm being a jerk. Um, but yeah, um, hmm. Did I talk about everything? Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, I think I did. So thank you for bearing with me um, on my little recap. Oh, there was one other thing. Oh, and by the way, too, um, this is the movie I was talking about. Lam Lambert, if you're watching, if you want to find this at the library, this is it. I know where I'm going. So you would definitely like that. That's definitely like a comfort movie in this house now. I just wanted to mention, if you're looking for a Thoth guidebook, um, this is great. 
I picked this up recently because I needed something from Amazon and I didn't want to pay shipping. I'm not, I'm not a member of Prime anymore. And I was trying to spend $25. So I was looking at my list of things and this had been on the list for years. And this is, this is great. Like, okay, I'll just get, I'll just show you like an example. Like, look at all the information that you get for one of the major cards. And then it goes on to page two. And there's like even page three. So yeah, um, I'm really excited about this. I have, you know, quite a few uh, Thoth or Thoth books, uh, but this was one I don't really hear people talk about. This is by Akron and Hajo Bansaf. It's US Games. I love the size. Yeah, I'm weird in that. I don't know why I vacillate on the pronunciation. For years I called it Thoth, and then lately I've been calling it Thoth. I don't know why. But anyway, on, th on that note, I feel like I have talked way too much. And I just want to say to whoever, to whoever is watching, thank you for bearing with me. And um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks for watching. Bye.